Hey, it's Chris, the Supply Chain Doctor and host of Supply Chain is Boring, bringing insight into the history of supply chain management and exposing you to some of the industry's thought leaders and driving forces. Several episodes back, we interviewed Ken Ackerman, one of the founders of what is now known as the Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals. During the interview, he mentioned doing a similar interview with a professor from the University of South Florida. After a bit of research, I found Dr. Jim Stock, co-director of the Monica Wooden Center for Supply Chain Management and Sustainability at the MUMA College of Business at USF. In part one of this two-part interview, we discuss Jim's distinguished career, programs at USF, and introduce his interview project. Enjoy. Dr. Stock, thanks for speaking with us today at Supply Chain is Boring. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes, sir. I recently interviewed Ken Ackerman about his career in the world of supply chain and logistics. At the end of the interview, he told me about you and the work you did interviewing industry leaders, I think going back to 2007 or so. My initial thought was, that sounds pretty boring. So here we are, and this is your chance to kind of prove me wrong. But before we get to that project, just tell me a little bit more about you, maybe how you got into the career and kind of where you've been uh, up until the project. Well, in terms of logistics and supply chain management, which is my primary focus now, I started out in college as a biology and chemistry dual major, which is what I got my degree in, attempting to go to medical school eventually. Did not do that for a variety of reasons. And when you have a bachelor's degree in uh, sciences, there's only three occupations available. Teach science in K through 12, uh, sell drugs, ethical drugs, of course, uh, <laughs> okay. or um, go to medical school. And none of those three options were really of interest or feasible. So as many students uh, said, what am I going to do? It was a recession, not many jobs. Uh, let me get a master's degree, an MBA. So a lot of my students do that. More education uh, if the job market is not positive. So I went through that, worked full time, and took me three years to get my master's. And then When I finished, I had to decide, well, what do I want to do now with this? And I had worked uh, full-time in the insurance industry as a commercialized insurance underwriter and had a very attractive offer from a a large insurance agency in Miami, Florida, to stay with them, which uh, was very tempting. But being in the master's program, interfacing with the faculty, I, I, I got the notion that it would be something to consider to perhaps stay at a university and teach and interface with students and and do research and all the other things that faculty do. And so that was the career path I chose. Went to Ohio State University and studied under uh, one of the gurus of logistics, Bernard Lalonde, who's now passed away, and uh, majored in marketing, the second field in logistics, because there weren't very many logistics jobs back in the 70s when I graduated. I took my first job uh, with at University of Notre Dame in South Bend. And uh, as my children love to, uh, to say, the highlight of that was Joe Montana was one of my students. Oh, as well, okay. As well as Adrian Dantling. Sure. Most of the athletes at Notre Dame were business majors because there wasn't a, uh, a major in uh, phys- physical education. I uh, was there for five years, uh, great school, the weather sucks, but uh, great school. Went to University of Oklahoma, which had a uh, fairly sizable logistics group within the Department of Marketing there, and stayed there for six years, uh, and then went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for a two-year uh, stint as a, as a visiting professor, teaching uh, Air Force officers about the commercial side of logistics management, and then went to Michigan State for two years, where I thought I would retire because that's one of the top schools in logistics and now supply chain management. But that uh, was not to be. Family issues, uh, wife's parents became ill, so we wanted to move someplace closer, and that's when we moved to Tampa at the University of South Florida, uh, where I have now been for This is my 31st year. So as you think back, I must have been 12 when I got my PhD. (laughs) I wish. But one of the great things about, I don't consider supply chain management boring. I've had a a hobby that I've been paid to do for 40 some years. It gets more interesting 
as years go by because uh, I see students who get great jobs, uh, who uh, move up corporate hierarchy uh, in their companies, and uh, that's a satisfying thing for me as an educator. Additionally, do research because that's required of faculty, and most of my research is in uh, the area which we call reverse logistics, product returns, and also uh, supply chain sustainability. So uh, with that, uh, I'm able to travel internationally. I've been to 46 different countries in my career for uh, stays of three days or longer, up to three months. And um, I get to see what people do in companies around the world. And I translate that back into the classroom. So I can use examples from Asia, or Africa, or Europe, or elsewhere, South America, to illustrate concepts to students who uh, may never get to those places. As I tell them, I said, innovation is not limited geographically. You see innovation throughout the world. And so uh, I've been able to do that and to see that. Uh, I toyed one time when I was about 40, should I go to med school? And I said, oh, I've been too successful in my job thus far. Do I want to give that up to going through med school and internship and, and all the other things? You'd have to go and be 50s before I could get a medical uh, license to practice. And I said, no, I'll be successful in what I'm doing here in the, in the uh, university. And I get to work with lots of companies now, uh, so it's not like I'm not involved in business, but I'm just there for short periods of time as opposed to full-time positions. So it's a great profession for students as well as faculty. Our program at USF, University of South Florida, uh, is fairly young. One of my goals was to establish uh, a Center for Supply Chain Management Sustainability. That's been done. It's now funded and named after a person who gave us a generous $5 million grant to do that. And we have companies that are members of the, uh, of the center that provide us with the internships, jobs, and we do research projects for them. In addition, the uh, second thing I want to do is to start an undergraduate major and a Master of Science in Supply Chain Management that went online this year in 2020. It's been a little bit of hesitant start because of the COVID situation and all classes being online and nothing face to face. That will change. We'll eventually get beyond this and we'll be in the rear view mirror. So we do have the, the undergraduate major and we do have the MS. And so I have one, one other priority which uh, has not come to fruition yet, but hopefully before I retire, I'll accomplish that one and then I can sink into oblivion and uh, be a happy man. Even after you retire, you can still continue to write and mm -hmm. guest lecture and do other things. So I enjoy this so much. I don't have very many hobbies because my hobby is my work. I'm excited. All of our faculty in, in our area are very passionate about what they do and teach. Students see that. And uh, we're starting to see more students become aware of our program and join into that, even during this online COVID situation that we're experiencing. So that's a, a, a background. As you can tell, I'm very excited about what I do. It's hard for a faculty member to talk briefly about any topic, but uh, uh, that's, that's the Cliff Notes version of my history. So the schools you reference, Ohio State, Notre Dame, University of Oklahoma, I know MSU, Michigan State, they have a very strong logistics program now. The others, Ohio State and, well, I don't know if Notre Dame does, they have okay logistics programs or you were there in the marketing capacity, I think that's what you said. Yeah, well, I'm still in the marketing department okay. and so I've always been in the marketing department, which is the focus I give to my logistics supply chain work. But Ohio State, where I got my PhD, uh, Oklahoma, Michigan State and South Florida have logistics supply chain programs now mm -hmm. or have had them for a while. Uh, Notre Dame did not. I was the sole individual there in logistics and supply chain management, but uh, I taught primarily marketing there. Sure, sure. Well, Notre Dame, a, a little shout out for my spouse. She went to St. Mary's, which is uh, yeah, right across the right, street. Right across the street. So we're big same weather there. though. Yeah, <laughs> same <laughs> weather. Yes, my daughter. We thought she was headed there as well, and then uh, she actually goes to University of Chicago which the, the weather is still about the same, but it, there's a little bit more to do in Chicago than South Bend. Uh, not as much snow. Not as much snow. But those are some, it was interesting, Jim, when I studied, I studied industrial engineering undergrad, 
And when I was studying, there was not, there wasn't a supply chain management or logistics classes. It was part of operations management. And then I tell people, even when I got my MBA, logistics was a chapter in a marketing book. And that's, that kind of goes back to how things have evolved. But now it's a full grown practice. You talked about reverse logistics, sustainability. Those are things we talk about in some of our, our APEX classes that I'm, I'm a part of as well. So I'm glad to hear that. I originally talked about this, uh, these recordings you started doing. Can you tell us about that project and you know, why you did it, what it's about, and where it stands? Sure. As you know, uh, there's three components of evaluation of faculty, teaching, research, and service, of which research is probably 80% uh, of the evaluation process. And so we're constantly looking towards uh, identifying topics to do some kind of research on. Uh, and so for my entire career, I keep a, a folder of research ideas because I have more ideas than time. Time is usually the most critical factor for me. And I don't have time or the money, perhaps, to do some projects that I think might be done. And this project that we're speaking on today, which is the, uh, the recordings of senior academics and some business people in the logistics and supply chain arena, really developed when I was at the University of Oklahoma as an associate professor. Didn't have nearly the salary nor the, the uh, research budget or travel budget at that time. And so I thought, you know, it would be a great idea to get these people on video and, and, uh, and tape and, and get their impressions about why they entered the field, what contributions they thought they, would, they made, what was their predictions for the future, because if you look at the social sciences in general, if you take art, poetry, short stories, novels, there's uh, luminaries that people read their material. And there's been books and certainly many articles written about them in terms of uh, their growing up, what influenced them, and so forth. We have a Salvador Dali Museum here in Tampa. And of course, you can go see his artwork, and most people are familiar generally with it. And there's been scores of books written about Salvador Dali and uh, why he did things. And you look at Rembrandt and all the, the other artists or, you know, Walt Whitman and you know, poets and those kinds of people. Lots written about them personally. So when you read their materials, there's always a, a book or an article or more available to understand, well, what did they, why did they paint this or write this? Or what did, what were they thinking about? What influenced them to even do that? Well, in the field of logistics supply chain management, really all we have are the published works or books of these people, the articles, monographs, and books that they published. We don't really know much about them at all. And I said, you know, if we want to get uh, a richer understanding of what these people did who made significant impressions in the discipline, started major programs at universities which now have hundreds of students or published about material that uh, transformed the discipline or any number of other things um, you know who were those people and of course uh, most of these people uh, have retired and uh, they're not young people anymore and as they pass away there's uh, you lose the opportunity to ask them these questions and so you'll, you'll never have the answers and so I did this primarily for graduate classes who uh, would teach maybe uh, logistics supply chain management theory or who would give some kind of overview to people who would influence the discipline. And I think that's where it's mostly been used. It was something that from a publication reward standpoint counts very little, but it was just something I felt should be done. And uh, as I uh, got here at University of South Florida with a much better position and more funding. I now had the resources to do that. And so um, I said, you know, I've got to get these people. I'll do, try to do a couple per year. That's not always been the case. Uh, I did that for a while, starting back in, I think, about 2007 or so, and was able to do that for a while until I went on a Fulbright over a couple of years and other things kept me from doing it. And then things like the COVID-19 and so forth, I'll be getting 
to start back doing that once we can do face-to-face -face things again because I like to talk to these people one-on-one -on -one and tape it. We use uh, professional quality uh, recordings as opposed to going to the store and buying a video camera or something else. Uh, and same thing is true with the actual audio recordings are very good quality. We put the uh, transcripts of the interviews together. All of the interviews have the same format, so they're consistent. Uh, they begin with uh, an overview of the person's history, their sort of professional bio, if you will. And then we get into uh, a number or series of questions that uh, go through their life from, from earliest uh, childhood to uh, deciding to go on for a PhD to deciding to get into logistics or supply chain management and what they felt their major contributions were, where they thought based upon their history and their significant impact on, on the development of the discipline, where they envisioned logistics supply chain management going in the future. And it's interesting, um, well, just, just a factoid that uh, of those, I think there's nine or so, nine or 10 recordings. One of them I still have to upload that's not up on, on the site yet. Half of those people are deceased. And so no one could ask them these questions again that I asked. It was interesting, one of the, the individuals who I mentioned in my background uh, at Ohio State, Bud Lalonde, who was my mentor there and dissertation chair, was one of the people I interviewed. He has since passed away. And I provide copies of all this to their uh, children. And uh, him and a few others that have, have now passed away, all of them have come back to me and said, we learned some things about our, our father that we didn't know, that you wow. asked, but we never, we never knew that. So it, it's been very rewarding from that perspective. And uh, as I said, uh, it's a free access. There's no cost to it. Uh, you can download the uh, transcripts and the videos and, and those kinds of things. And so that's going to continue in perpetuity, I assume. That was how I set it up, but we'll, we'll check with the university. Who knows what they might do when I retire, but uh, we'll try to keep them up for use because history never gets old. It's always old, mm -hmm. but it is history. To learn about some of these people in a more intimate way has been very, very rewarding to me to understand more about them, not just what they wrote, because I've read most of what they've written, but to understand why they did it was very uh, enlightening. And I will make reference to that, that link once I get that from you in terms okay. of, you know, that's really what, what my goal here is, uh, is Jim, as I were, I appreciated what you've done there, the, the time you invested and the people you've connected with there. And I really want to kind of get that, re-expose that to the market and just let people know. So what I'm going to do is, is basically just provide the audio portions in separate podcasts that I can promote through my channel. And then through, I'm also affiliated with Supply Chain Now which is a, a much larger audience. So we've got many, many, many uh, millions of listeners, uh, eyeballs and ears and live streams and YouTubes and all those types of things. So that's what I'm going to do is, is provide those, but hopefully encourage people to come and take a look, you know, more at what you've done, the actual audios, the videos themselves. Uh, so that's my vision as time allows. Good. So, so some of your, you, you interviewed Ken Ackerman. How did you select these people? Donald Bowersox, James, I know some of them, John Langley, he was at, Georgia Tech for a bit, now at Tennessee. So how did you select the people? Because since I was paying for it and, and using my time, free time to do it, uh, I selected people that had significant reputations. At the time, all of them were still active. I don't think any of them had retired uh, at the point that I started this uh, project. And uh, they were people I knew, so I could call them up on the phone and say, yeah, you know, I've got this project. Would you like to be involved in it? And um, they all said yes. I either went to their institutions. So, for example, I interviewed Lalonde at Ohio State. I interviewed John Langley at Penn State, where he took a position after Tennessee. And Ken Ackerman, I interviewed him at Ohio State also. And so uh, I go to where the person is. There were a few people, such as uh, Jim Heskett, who was involved in the real early development of logistics and supply chain management, who was still working part-time at Harvard where he went after he left Ohio State. But he was 
spending part of the time in uh, Sarasota, which is just south of us. And so he came up to school. Don Bowersox, his, uh, his son was going to University of South Florida. So he wanted to see the school. So he was here and I interviewed him while he was on campus. And so we went to wherever was the easiest for these uh, individuals to go. Whatever it took, uh, I interviewed Tom Mincer uh, a month before he passed away from cancer. And I interviewed him. He was in his house in bed because he was bedridden at the time with his cancer. Uh, I wish I would have seen him a little bit earlier to do that, but that's probably the longest interview, by the way, of all of the, the interviews is the one with Tom Menser. Interesting, interesting man. Learned a lot about him personally that I never knew because he was sort of, uh, as some people are, they're, they don't like to brag about their accomplishments. They're somewhat sort of uh, humble and in a way quiet about what they've done uh, and don't uh, share intimately about their backgrounds. You know, we got into a lot of those things. So it was really enlightening. And as I look back at those people's writings and their books, uh, when I read some of that material, I think I know a bit more about what they're writing about because they told me what influenced them. So uh, it was a great project that's continuing, a little bit slower pace now, but uh, it's still continuing. And we'll, we'll see how many folks I get before I'm able to stop. But again, it's something that I did because I thought it was the right thing to do. Sure. Not for any personal reward I would get. I've had a few conference proceedings and so forth from it, but nothing significant to impact my publication record in, in a big way. Is there a favorite that you have out of them? I, I don't know if you can say there's a favorite or an interesting story, or you kind of mentioned one with, with Tom Mincer. Anything else that comes to well, mind? Well, there, there's little little factoids that you learn about people. Uh, Don Bowersox, who uh, was at Michigan State his entire, most of his, of his entire career, you know, as you look at people like Bowersox versus Lalonde, who, who work together professionally because their careers overlap, uh, Don Bowersox was known for creating the, uh, the Michigan State program. He was there. He had a number of doctoral students, many of whom stayed on at MSU, became dean of the business school later in life. His involvement probably created the fact that MSU is uh, one of the top two programs in the country, if not the world. And it has a huge faculty. When I was on the uh, staff there as a faculty member, we had almost 15 faculty members in logistics and supply chain management. I guess when I was there, supply chain management had just started. Mid 80s was the first time supply chain management appeared in print. And so uh, supply chain was very early, it was mostly logistics. Now, on the other hand, Lalonde put most of his emphasis on his doctoral students. They had a reasonable program, which Jim Heskett had, had started with Lalonde, and Lalonde replaced him when Heskett went to Harvard. But Lalonde put most of his emphasis on his doctoral students. He had over 60 doctoral students whom he chaired their dissertations, which is a super number. You know, I probably chaired a dozen dissertations in my career, but he had over 60. And uh, what was interesting is when you look at the 60 plus and what those people have done, a majority of them have had significant impact in the marketplace. It was their work ethic, it was their passion for the discipline and so forth. You know, someone like Lalonde went into the field uh, early. Someone like Bowersox, for example, he said he almost became a pharmacist as opposed to a logistician. It was very close, uh, but he, he made that decision to, uh, to do that. Tom Menser almost went to work full time for General Motors because they had uh, linkages with some of the senior executives there who uh, uh, wanted him to stay. And he had uh, went to the General Motors Institute, part of his uh, education. And so he had a lot of contacts with very high up uh, people. They offered him a position to be uh, one of the, the uh, senior executives 
uh, covering distribution logistics for GM. He decided against that and made a significant contribution in, as an educator. And I think all the people that uh, are there, the, the one person who is on the list that I videoed who is not a logistician is the gentleman from Oklahoma, which was the first interview I did. His area was management. And the reason I interviewed him was he had written and has subsequently written multiple editions of this, History of Management. And so he and I, because of our relationship we developed uh, when I was at the University of Oklahoma, he was a natural to, to, to uh, interview because he was so interested in, in historical aspects of management, which do overlap with logistics, because a lot of the people in management were in the operations management area, and uh, which became one of the foundational groups for uh, uh, logistics management and certainly supply chain management. And so uh, the others uh, were just folks who were had significant careers. They were they had top of mind awareness when you talk to people and say, you know, who comes to mind if you were going to do interviews of, of senior folks who had significant impacts, who would they be? And those people would typically be mentioned. And so I tried to get as many of those as possible. Uh, and one thing I've noticed uh, in my uh, just sort of an anecdotal view is that there seems to be about a 20 year difference, 15 to 20 year difference between luminaries in the profession. So if you look at, uh, you know, there are certainly people before the Bauer Soxes and the Lons and, and those kinds of folks uh, and Heskets. But after them, in about 15 years, you had the Mensers and you had other folks uh, develop, uh, Lambert, myself, who had these people as dissertation chairs, as mentors. I look at the people that are about 15 to 20 years after Menser, myself, Lambert, and others, and I see those students now in a position where they're starting to make significant contributions. And a lot of them are women. You know, when we first went into this profession, it was almost dominated by males, but there's a lot of women uh, in the uh, educational profession, and by the way, in our program, 55% of the uh, students are women. They're doing very well. Uh, one of the things we do measure, by the way, is not just graduation placement rates, which I said were 95% of our students. 100% of them get internships, by the way. Some of them get more than one. In terms of companies they go with and promotions they receive, the average number of promotions of uh, these uh, individuals is two to three within three years. They made two or three promotions within three years of being hired by a company. And these are companies like Amazons and Targets and you know big companies, Citibank, etc. And you know we're competing against Tennessee and Michigan State and Arkansas and all of those places. Uh, but our students do pretty well. Uh, I'm thinking of one woman at uh, Amazon who's had four promotions in three years. Or. She's a sharp woman, and uh, that's one thing that attracts new students. The placement, the ability to get a high-paying job, our starting salaries average 55000 plus bonuses, which usually gets it to sixty-five or seventy for undergraduates, which is very good, and uh, they're making a lot, they're making six figures after three or four years, and uh, the fact that they can move up in your organization. They're doing interesting stuff. You know, it's nice to get up every morning and say, wow, I'm enjoying going to work. I told my kids, none of whom are in my field, but I said, whatever you choose to do, make sure you like it because you're going to do it for a long time. That's why I like uh, doing what I'm doing. Uh, I like it. I see impacts in students, and particularly when I get, it makes me feel old, when I get uh, sons and daughters of uh, previous students who have gone into the profession, they said, you know, why don't you get into this logistics thing? Like when I was at USF or Michigan State, I had this professor that really turned me on to it. And they come and they're in my class says, you know, remember my father, my mother? Yeah, I remember them. I used to take pictures of all my students so I'd know who they were. 
Okay. But they never asked for uh, recommendations. Uh, and so I still have those. Uh, in any event, it's a great profession. I wish I was younger because I see so many things. My folder of research topics gets bigger uh, because I have, I have too many topics and I still don't have more time. Uh, that doesn't change. And uh, actually less time with all my other responsibilities I have. It's just so interesting to look at stuff that has an impact on society generally, on companies specifically, and on the people who are involved in the profession. It affects them uh, in a positive way. How can you not get excited about that? It's definitely not boring to be involved in, in that process. You're doing a good job of uh, disproving my theorem. This concludes part one of the interview with Dr. Jim Stock. Check out the show notes for a link to the interviews by Jim. Supply Chain is Boring is part of the Supply Chain Now Network. We highlight historical events, companies, and people in supply chain management and create a picture of where the industry is headed. Interested in learning more about supply chain technology startups, mergers, acquisitions, and how companies evolve? Take a listen to Tequila Sunrise, crafted by Greg White. Or check out This Week in Business History with Supply Chain Now's own Scott Luton to learn more about everyday things you may take for granted and pick up short stories you can use as general conversation starters. The Logistics with a Purpose series puts a spotlight on neat and interesting organizations who are working toward a greater cause. If you're interested in logistics, freight, and transportation, take a listen to the Logistics and Beyond series with the Adapt and Thrive Mindset Sherpa, Jamin Alvarez. And check out the newest program, Tech Talk, hosted by industry veteran and Atlanta's own Corinne Bursa. Bursa will discuss all things digital supply chain. If interested in sponsoring this show or others on Supply Chain Now, send a note to chris at supplychainnow.com. And remember, supply chain is boring.